All right, good morning. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, nice and early. Thanks for coming down. We're looking forward to a great couple days here. Please uh, try and take a full advantage of the faculty. You have an excellent faculty here that's going to be mingling around. And a lot of this uh, format of this uh, presentation is a really case-based discussion. So we really uh, want to involve you as much as possible um, here and in the we're lab. Sure here. All right, Except so we're going to start out um, this morning. Yeah, the first really session good. is ankle instability. Check, 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 All right, check, so check. lateral ankle sprain is check the most one, common check, ligamentous one, injury that we see, check, 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 um, really 30,000 per day in this country alone, 25% of all athletic injuries, so very common injury. We see them very frequently, um, except if you, you're taking care of some elite athletes and then pretty much everyone gets an MRI. That can help with those uh, patients uh, to guide the time out of sports, to time any type of rehab they're doing, gives them a better sense. Um, you also want to miss other, you don't want to miss other diagnoses such as syndesmosis injuries, perineal tendon injuries, Achilles tendon injuries. Obviously, you have to look at their alignment as well um, to see if it might be related to some hind foot malalignment. Most of the patients uh, can be put into physical therapy program, combination of proprioception, strengthening, some type of bracing. I typically like a lace-up brace that you can see here on this player. And most of the time, these patients do well. Really about 85, 90% of the time, they're going to do, they're going to recover within two, three months. So acute surgical repair is not supported in the literature. That being said, chronically, about 24, 20 to 40% of the time, patients still have recurrent symptoms. And even at six and a half years later, this study showed 40% of patients could still be symptomatic from a single lateral sprain. And that's the concern we have, is that then you end up with a laterally deficient ankle, they have persistent symptoms, can lead to intraarticular damage, and eventually, potentially, arthritic changes as well. So that's where surgery comes into play in patients with chronic instability, so patients that have failed three to four months of non-operative treatment. And so these are some of the uh, options that uh, we've had uh, throughout the years. Um, we're going to focus today mainly on the anatomic repairs. Historically, non-anatomic repairs were advocated in the literature, these tenodicing or check grain procedures, um, but they've kind of fallen out of favor. They tend to sacrifice some normal anatomic structures and tendons. They had higher complication rates, and in long term, the results really didn't hold up. There was a lot of weakness, abnormal motion, um, you affected other joints or arthritic changes. So these have kind of fallen out of favor, except in really an extreme salvage uh, position. So we really want to try and focus on an anatomic repair, anatomic reconstruction, which can most closely restore the normal anatomy and the mechanics of the ankle. Um, technically, a lot of these procedures are relatively simple. You can maintain a, a pretty full range of motion, and you can have pretty good results over time. So historically, the gold standard was a modified Brosten procedure. We would prepare the ATFL plus minus the CFL. Um, the Gould modification later we had a reinforcement with the inferior extensor retinaculum. And again, about 85 to 90% 90 of the time, the patients would do well, uh, and you didn't sacrifice other anatomic structures. So the way that I've managed to do this over the years, I use regional anesthesia, patient supine, as you can see here. I put a buttock, uh, a, a, a elevation, a bump under the ipsilateral buttock. And I also put a bump under the knee or the ankle, depending on the patient. You want to make sure that the bump is, as you can see it here, really under the, the ankle as opposed to the heel, because you want to minimize any anterior tailor subluxation during your case. Skin approach, I used to do the anterior J. Now I tend to do more of an extensile approach. Uh, I think it's much more flexible for me, depending on what else I'm doing. You want to go through a full thickness flap down to your uh, capsule, and then you can mobilize the lateral segment of the inferior extensor retinaculum that you're going to want to repair over the top at the end of the procedure. Um, the extensile approach allows me to routinely examine the perineal tendons. Um, so they're not always going to be a, a tear, but most likely you're going to see some kind of tenous synovitis. So it allows you to examine that, make sure they're tracking correctly, and then you can debris the tenous synovitis if that's the only thing that you can see. Um, and then I divide the capsule and ligaments off of the fibula directly. I leave a two to three millimeter cuff on the distal fibula, which I elevate in subparastal fashion. Um, you can see uh, of the ATFL, you usually can leave the CFL intact posteriorly. And when you're thinking about your, your repair, uh, it's good to remember that the ATFL and the CFL have this common fibular insertion. And then once I've elevated subparastal fashion, I'll roughen up the distal fibula with a rongeur, typically. And then um, you can set up your repair either with sutures. Um, you could do drill holes into the fibula. I tend to use two anchors. Uh, make sure you don't violate the joint so you have the proper angle. And then when you repair it, I tend to do it in neutral, slight dorsiflexion, slight eversion. And I tend to do three pass the sutures. There are a variety of ways you can do this, with mattress sutures. And, but I tend to do three. So my first pass, 
I pass it through the ligament of the capsule, and then I secure that down to distal fibula. Then I pass it retrograde, and, and I secure down the periosteal sleeve over the newly anchored uh, ligament and capsule. And then my final pass captures the inferior extensor retinaculum. Now, the next uh, adjunct to doing a modified brostrum uh, would be to do an ankle arthroscopy at the same time. So first do your arthroscopy and then do your open repair. Uh, and multiple studies have shown that the majority of these patients that have instability will have associated intraarticular problems, and only 20% could be seen if you just did an open procedure. And Ferkel even said up to 95% of these patients had intraarticular pathology. So we tend to add on ankle arthroscopy at the beginning of the case. Um, basically, again, the patient's still supine. You can just use a standard arthroscopy. You don't have to use the small joint scope. Um, just your standard portals. Um, you, you, you look at your interarticular pathology, synovectomy, debridement, remove any impingement lesions. Typically, this can be done with non-invasive distraction. If there's any type of osteochondral lesion that I'm anticipating, then I'll use some form of distraction. Um, and then you just close it. I reprep, I change the gloves, and I move on to the open part of the repair. Now, the next evolution was really to go to try and do an all inside repair, so all arthroscopic brostrum. And so, basically, you look at the evolution, it's kind of the same way that we saw things evolve in the shoulder and the knee. So, in, in the early 90s, we're doing everything open in the rotator cuff and the bank repairs, and now that's pretty much all done arthroscopically. Same thing in the knees, arthroscopically assist ACLs, now we're doing them all inside. Meniscal repairs the same way. So, we've had kind of a similar evolution in some respects with the brostrum. This, the indications for, to do an arthroscopic brostrum are the same as for an open procedure. Um, there have been some studies that have shown really no difference in the outcomes between all inside versus an open repair, but you have the benefit potentially from the smaller incisions, um, decreased pain, less swelling versus the open, but potentially equal outcomes in terms of strength. I would say the contraindications for this procedure um, are similar to potentially contraindications for your open procedure. So extremely high demand athletes or laborers, I think uh, you still want to get the open uh, repair. Uh, morbid obesity, patients where you're worried about tissue quality, so collagen disorders, hyperelasticity, failed previous surgeries, uh, patients that use tobacco products. Um, also, if patients have a large perineal tendon tear that you're aware of in advance, that you know you're going to have to make a pretty open incision, then that's always good to use an extensile incision. You can fix both problems through the one incision. If you're going to do the case so the patients are supine, um, you can use non-invasive distraction. And, um, I like to mark out a safe zone here, which is described. Um, it was written up originally by Dr. Dracos, who's here today. So the safe zone here, you, see, you want to see the posterior board of the fibula, the superior margin of your perineal tendons. You want to mark out where the intermediate branch of your superficial perineal nerve is. And then about 1.5 centimeters distal to the tip of the fibula is where the inferior extensor retinaculum is. So that's really, this is your safe zone right here. Um, and then you do your standard arthroscopy, standard portals. Um, there have been some reports in literature of accessory pores, but usually you can get by with just the standard, uh, the two portals. You want to debride laterally a little bit more extensively. You really want to see that distal anterior face of the fibula um, to help with your uh, anchor placement. I think in the, begin in the beginning, it's probably helpful to do fluoro with this because you can verify where your anchor is going to be placed. But once you get a hang of it, you don't need to use the fluoro as much. Uh, and then once you can see here the, the distal anterior fibula, so this is distal, so your first anchor goes about one centimeter proximal to the tip, uh, and it really just goes anterior to posterior. You angle a little bit to make sure you stay in the fibula, depending on if they have any type of hind foot malalignment. Uh, and then you have your sutures. You bring them out through the anterior lateral portal. You can put your sec second anchor just about one centimeter above. Uh, and then you have a sharp suture passer that you can pass the, uh, the sutures through the um, ligament and the capsule and the retinaculum. So you can do this either inside out or you can do outside in. I think uh, it's easier to do the first uh, anchor with the two sutures going inside out. And then the second two, it's easier to go outside in. Um, and you want to advance each suture about one centimeter anterior to the next. So you're starting out posteriorly, just anterior to the perineal tendons. And you advance one centimeter, one centimeter, one centimeter. And you want to stay, make sure that you stay inferior to that um, superficial perineal nerve. The most common thing to get entrapped is the perineus tertius. Uh, but then once you have the sutures out, you make a small incision, you use a probe or a hook to pull the sutures out through that incision, and then you can tie them down. So you tie down the capsule, the retinaculum, the fibula, and you can actually watch this through the scope to see the soft tissues coming down onto the fibula. But sometimes, you know, most, most of us think, well, our brostrums do well, our patients do well, but the reality is maybe they're not doing as well as we think. Maybe the failure rate or the suboptimal outcome rate is higher than we've thought. And so Mufuli did this study, um, which is one of the only studies looking at more a longer-term follow-up. 
and found that only 60% of these patients actually got back to their pre-injury level at nine years. 16% less activity, 26% abandoned all activity, and 30% had radiographic signs of DJD. So maybe the Brostrom repair, which is really the gold standard, maybe it's not, not enough. So sometimes augmenting your repair uh, can be helpful and beneficial. So especially in patients, again, that might have um, uh, poor tissue quality, um, attenuated tissue, so it could be, again, so one of these generalized ligamentous laxity, patients with a long history of recurrent instability so that the tissue is very thin. Uh, in vision cases, high demand patients, athletes, um, obese patients, again, patients use tobacco products and maybe workers' comp patients as well. So when we think about augmenting a repair, I think we have a variety of uh, um, options. You could certainly use additional anchors, additional sutures. Um, you have graft options, autograft, allograft options. Um, there's other um, internal types of bracing where you can add sutures um, to augment your repair. And there's some other uh, you know, human dermal collagen scaffolds you can lay over the top if you desire. Um, there's a study, a biomechanical study, that showed that the problem with the brostrums is that at time zero, you have at best 50% the strength of your normal ATFL. And so the problem with that is then you have to immobilize these patients a long time. You can't start rehabilitation for a while because you have a significantly weak uh, ligament. So if you can add something to that, and then at time zero, your strength is equal or even better than a native, native ATFL, then theoretically it's safe to begin the rehab early. It's also a, a, a stiffer, stronger ligament. Um, and it will also minimize elongation over time, so that hopefully the longer-term results will be a lot better. So if you're using a, a suture tape uh, type of augmentation, the benefits are this is a flat suture. It's knotless. Technically, it's pretty easy. It doesn't add that much time, maybe five or ten minutes. There's no donor site morbidity, morbidity. You have immediate stability, again, at time zero. It's equal or stronger than your native ATFL. Um, you can immobilize the patients less. You can start them walking sometimes right away. You can start the rehab a lot quicker so they don't get stiffer. Um, and over time, uh, these patients may maintain a, a good outcome. Um, right now, there are no long-term studies on these techniques. Um, there's a little bit of increased costs, but it might be worth it. So the way that I do this, uh, again, I do an extensile lateral approach. I may extend a little proximal and distal to accommodate the, the added anchors. Um, again, I use the ankle bump because I want to avoid any anterior tibial subluxation. Um, I still use the fluoro um, for my anchors, but as you, as you get comfortable with this, you don't necessarily need to use the fluoro. Uh, and you want to make sure that you aim whoop, for the um, non-articular uh, side of the talus. There's a little ridge there laterally. It's pretty much in line if the foot's dorsiflect in line with the fibular tip. Uh, and then you want to angle in about 40, 45 degrees from lateral to medial. You want to aim it slightly proximal. And you want to aim slightly superior. You want to avoid the subtalar joint. And then once that anchors in, so I put the tailor anchor in first. Uh, so I anchor that. Then I go ahead and I do my regular brostrum. Uh, and I'm anticipating that I'm going to have another anchor coming in the fibula. So I'll space my anchors in the fibula accordingly for my brostrum. Uh, and I, do my, I complete my brostrum. And then I can put my anchor for the suture tape augmentation above that between the two anchors. So I'm not uh, crowding too much in the fibula. And the way you have to think of this, so this is an extra articular augmentation. This is not meant to be in the joint. Um, I put a freer there because I want to make sure I don't over tighten it. You don't want to stress shield your repair. Um, but you need to think about this as kind of laying it over the top. Right? So it should, you should think of it more of a seat belt, more of a carpet kind of over the repair, um, as opposed to the repair itself. So if you, if you don't get a successful brostrum, if the tissues are such poor quality that you can't even repair it together, then this is not something meant to be in place of your brostrum. This is something meant to augment your brostrum. Um, historically, um, the other option was to use an uh, autograft or an allograft for reconstruction. This is something that I still use in certain patients. Um, so here you're trying to reconstruct the ATFL and usually the CFL as well. So I tend to use a semitendinous allograft. Um, I put my interferon screw in the talus first, um, and that's a, a hidden, a blind tunnel. And then I drill my sockets uh, for the ATFL and CFL. Um, so it's usually about 105 degrees. I first I bring the, the tissue um, from anterior to posterior, and I secure that with a screw. Then I thread it through and I bring it from posterior to anterior. And then when I reconstruct the CFL, I place it down, uh, again, deep to the perineals, and I pull that through, um, uh, and, and I can gauge the tension myself. I pull it all the way through from lateral medial. So when to do a suture tape type of augmentation versus some type of graft reconstruction? I typically, I will still, I'm using the suture tape more and more now if, if I'm doing a primary reconstruction. For the grafts I use, if the native tissue, again, is just not good enough, so you're not getting repair, 
And again, I think the suture tape is not a, it's not a, a, a replacement for your Boston repair, but this can be your replacement. Patients have had multiple previous procedures. I think it's better to use this tendon uh, technique. If they've had failed previous perineal rerouting procedures, I think you should also consider this. And if they have any significant hind from malalignment, I think this is a better option. Postoperatively, I still splint people, usually about 10 days to two weeks, uh, just for wound healing purposes. Um, I let them full weight bear in the boot um, at four weeks. I will say that with the suture tape augmentation, I'm able to advance this a lot quicker. So usually I'm still protecting them for the first 10 days really just for wound healing, but after that I can really let them start walking almost right away. Otherwise, patients are usually back in a brace around six weeks starting physical therapy. Um, with my, when I augment the repairs, they're usually back to full activities closer to the three-month mark. Um, if I'm doing um, just the regular brostrum, it's usually a little longer, usually around four months. So in conclusion, um, the lateral ligament injuries are very common, especially in a young active population. Most of these injuries can be su successfully treated non-operatively, so appropriate bracing and physical therapy. Problem is that over, from 20 to 40% of these patients will have chronic symptoms and chronic limitations, and the maybe um, these patients, patients will benefit from surgical repair. Um, we've thought the gold standard has always been the brostrum, but maybe our results are maybe suboptimal, not as good as we thought they were. Um, I think that it's important that you address the intraarticular pathology concurrently, so I still tend to do um, the arthroscopy first and address that and then go on to my repair. In the future, we may look more and more at these uh, augmentations of our repairs. It can give us a stronger repair, can allow us to mobilize the patients quicker, it could lead to improved outcomes in the short term and the long term, and minimize the chances for this repair to loosen over time, especially I uh, would try it first maybe in your younger patients, your higher demand athletes, some of your revisions maybe that have good tissue quality. Thank you.